Afternoon, folks. I'm going to put the tractor in reverse here. I'm going to do something a little different, apparently. So, uh, my name is Carl Elke. I, uh, as the introduction said, I uh, currently farm just west of Sioux Falls. Uh, grew up in West Central Hartford area. Uh, did most of my training down at USD. Also did uh, my final training down at University of Nebraska. I uh, grew up. Row crop, uh, cattle farm. Uh, I, was, I was a cow calf guy when my mom and dad, uh, dad retired. Oh, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. They started going to Texas in the winter, so uh, I took over the cattle operation for a time. Uh, learned in a hurry that uh, kids in a job in town doesn't work real well with calving season, so uh, ended up uh, selling my cows probably th two, three years ago. And now I just have row crops. Uh, corn, soybeans, hay, uh, a couple of my neighbors uh, have some of their pasture ground uh, in some of uh, the conservation programs, the SRAM, SNAP program, uh, so I do hay some of those uh, towards the end of the year, but uh, my hay all goes um, elsewhere, I don't, uh, don't have cattle anymore. I've been at a very McKinnon hospital uh, coming up on 19 years. Uh, farm stress hotline uh, kind of came to fruition. Probably more the fall of 18, early 19. Uh, if you look at some of the stats, uh, which I have in my slideshow as well, um, probably between one in three and one in four folks uh, through their lifetime uh, can have a diagnosable mental illness. Uh, the biggest concern that I had is we weren't really seeing the demographic of farmers and ranchers either in my outpatient practice or in the hospital. Yet, we make up a huge portion of the folks in South Dakota, and a lot of it came back to stigma, you know, the fear of mental illness. You can't see anything wrong with yourself. You know, your arm's not broken. You know, your nose isn't pointing over here when you got kicked in the face by a cow. None of it works. So if you can't see it, it's not there. You know, even historically, uh, you know, mental health issues, you know, kind of kicked under the rug, you know, kind of that you know, work with it, pull your bootstraps up, get stronger. You know, or that's a lot of the verbiage that took place for a long time. And I guess that's what I aim to change more than anything. Uh, give folks an option. I'll let folks know that, you know, there's folks out there with you know, some background. You can understand where they're coming from, you know, because a lot of it's verbiage. And if you're looking at uh, psychology or psychiatry, the number one thing for good outcomes with patients is rapport. Rapport with your patient, rapport with your provider. You know, can you talk to them easily? Do they understand where you're coming from or do you just feel like you're spinning your wheels and they just kind of got the deer in the headlights look at you when you're talking about how many times, you know, you've tried to plant one field of beans, but every time you hook the planter up it rains or you've gone around the same wet area four times. Um, all of those things, you know, does anyone really understand, you know, the trials and tribulations of dairy and calving during calving season? Um, I've never done dairy. I've never been a hog guy. I have been, like I said, I still do row crops. I've done cow calf. I mean, I was calving in the middle of the ice storm a few years back. I mean, it was miserable. And, you know, to have someone that can know that, uh, it helps a lot. And that's kind of the biggest thing that I was aiming for. So, uh, kind of throughout the whole premise or the whole start of the, uh, the hotline, you know, I've kind of coined the phrase of you're not alone because a lot of people feel like you're alone. And farming and ranching in general, it's an isolative occupation. I mean, we sit on tractors for long amounts of time. We're, you know, we're in the shop by ourselves for, for a lot of time, um, riding a horse, checking cows. A lot of times you're not with folks. Now, granted, social media, yeah, you can have a, your phone call away sometimes or you got the radio on, but still, um, there's a difference in being on a phone and there's a difference in having someone there to talk to, so. Farming gives us some pretty cool pictures though, doesn't it? Uh, this is, harvest is always a good one for me. Uh, that's my combine. Uh, that was this past fall. You know, so a lot of folks ask, you know, especially folks in town that still don't understand, you know, where the stake on 
um, at hy V comes from is, you know, why do people farm? Why do they ranch? And a lot of it comes down to it, it's an identity. You know, it's not an occupation. You know, my job at the hospital, yeah, obviously it's gotten my, me in front of a lot of different people and it's kind of changed who I was there, but, you know, I still identify myself more as a farmer because that's what I truly enjoy. Um, long time ago, long, long time ago, I'm not even going to date myself there, but, uh, you know, I wanted to farm right out of high school. My dad basically said, it's not going to happen. We were too close to Sioux Falls. We really don't have enough acres. Uh, my parents own a quarter. I don't own any ground. I cash rent everything. You know, my dad said I had to get an education first. You know, I could maybe come back and farm afterwards. So, you know, off to medical school, you know, undergrad then medical school I went. And now, in hindsight, it's given me the opportunity to do this, which is great. Uh, they married into it. Uh, folks, you know, a lot of times... You know, you'll see ranchers marry ranchers or farmers marry farmers, but still there's folks that come from the city. You know, they meet in college or something like that. And a lot of times those people are walking into something that they don't understand. And that's hard for them to see the trials and tribulations of farming because, you know, let's be honest, it's pretty romanticized in the movies. It looks pretty cool to see the guy trotting around on his horse and, you know, it looks real easy, you know. A lot of commercials on TV, you know, we push a button, tractor drives itself, you know, it looks pretty easy. But, you know, it's the behind the scenes stuff that causes a lot of the stress. You know, there's an obligation to the people before us and the people that come after us. You know, the folks before us, you know, they've made it through, you know, the dirty 30s, the farm crisis of the 80s. You know, so they sit back and ask, you know, how did this farm survive? How did this farm or ranch survive those things? And why are we going to lose the farm in the year 2018 or 2019, you know, just because of water or a drought now? And the fact, you know, we want to have, you know, there's a significant desire to want to have that farm or ranch there for your kids. You know, you want that name to go on. You know, this is the hard one for me, but I've heard it from a ton of producers. They can't imagine doing anything else. A lot of times I'll tell them, okay, let's see, so you're coming in for a 3 o'clock in the afternoon appointment with me. Probably before that time, if we're in the middle of calving season or in the middle of planting, you've already been probably an agronomist, you know, probably an accountant. You might have been a mechanic to even get here. You know, your kid shows up with a cut on their finger. You might have been a pediatrician for a few minutes. You know, you can weld, you can fix things. You know, I tell everyone, you know, Pretty much any farmer or rancher, you know, they know how to fix the wobble box on their bean head or their sickle mower, but fixing themselves, that's a whole different story. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, they don't think they can do anything else, but in all essence, you know, folks like yourselves, you have a huge, huge set of skills, you know, that are available to you. Not telling you you have to get another job, because I don't want to get another job either, but... And the other thing I guess I try to drive home because I think it's probably one of the bigger stigma points with mental health and mental illness, um, there is a difference. You know, the words get thrown around synonymously, um, but in essence, you know, it's easier for people to understand, you know, there's physical health and well-being and there's physical illness. Those are two, two different things. You know, your physical health and wellness is, you know, kind of how your body is on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, your exercise regimen, the way you eat. Mental health has the same thing. You know, there's going to be ups and downs. Just because you have a bad day doesn't mean we're going to slap the scarlet letter of depression on you and that's going to be the way it goes because that's not the way it happens. Um, but a mental illness, same as a physical illness. You can have diabetes. You can have high blood pressure issues. You can have cancer. You can have a fractured leg of some sort. You know, those are physical illnesses, and we have mental illnesses too. You know, a lot of the fear is, is that, okay, you're going to diagnose me with a mental illness and I'm going to have this for the rest of my life. Some will. You know, it's, it's hard for me to tell a lot of folks in psychiatry, we don't cure anything. You know, a lot of times the producer will be sitting in front of me and they, they're like, well, what the heck am I doing here then if you don't cure anything? Well, a lot of times we're here for, to focus on functionality. You know, a lot of things in mental health are transient. You know, they're due to what's going on at the time. 
whether that's stressors on the farm. And when we start to peel the layers back, farmers and ranchers, you guys have the exact same stressors that anyone else that I'll see for a mental health appointment does. Issues with relationships, family, monetary concerns, work changes. All those different things come into play. You guys just have a different subset of uh, stressors as well, you know, because you're in production agriculture. And it's, you know, it's been tough. Granted, yeah, I'm sitting here talking to you when prices are a little bit better. You know, 2018, 2019, it was miserable. I mean, record prevent plant acres, prices in the tank, tariffs, all those different things that we couldn't control. And guys and ladies were carrying that blame on themselves, which they had nothing to do with that, but that's what happens. You know, then just a lot of the misnomers with mental illness come into play. Um, but I do like to tell people and reiterate, you know, these are not lifelong things. Uh, we even have things called adjustment disorders in, in psychiatry. You know, that's, that's a transient concern where, yeah, you might be having issues with depression, anxiety, sleep issues associated with that, but it's not something that's going to be there forever. Um, you know, mental illness doesn't care. You know, it's non-discriminatory. It doesn't care how many acres you farm, how big your herd is, your age, how many kids you got, your financial status. It's non-discriminatory across the board. So, you know, don't think that just because, you know, so-and-so looks like they're doing better that they are truly doing better because that's another part of the stigma of mental health. Um, it's not something that can be overcome with willpower. You can't just will it away. You can't sweep it under the rug. You can't sleep it away. You know, a lot of those concerns, you know, I think we're doing a better job. We aren't there yet by any means. Uh, historically, you know, that's a pre-generational thing that's kind of come up over the years of, you know, let's just not talk about it and hope it goes away. Or, hey, we don't talk about Cousin Charlie because Cousin Charlie's just off a little bit. Well, the folks, the person that needed more help in that family than anyone is Cousin Charlie. You know, so that's where, and we get a lot of different numbers. You know, I would probably say, you know, if there's what, five, six of you at most, four to six of you at each table, you know, you could probably look at at least one to two of you on each table, potentially, now this is globally, you know, would have issues with the mental illness at some point in time in your life. Does that mean it's a chronic thing that's gonna be lifelong? Absolutely not. Uh, but at some point in time, one or two of you would meet criteria for a diagnosable mental illness. You know, why don't farmers and ranchers ask for help? One, where would they go? You know, some of that's a time concern. Some of them are fearful of being even treated in their own hometown. You know, it's one thing to walk into their primary care provider with, you know, a wart on their hand or, you know, their elbow pointing over the wrong way because they fell off the tractor or something. But to go in and even talk to that primary care provider, you know, about mental health concerns, that induces a significant amount of trepidation and fear. Because that might be the same exact person that you're going to see at the basketball game later. Or that's the same person that you're going to run into, you know, at, at the grocery store. I mean, we live in small towns, granted. You guys live in a lot smaller towns than I do, but towns are small. You know, we run into people. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, there's even a fear even talking about those things. Even though there is multiple layers of privacy set up, you know, patient provider privacy, HIPAA is there. You know, it's, there's still been studies done that even folks who committed suicide later had visited their primary care provider even multiple times within the six months prior to that but never voiced a concern because, you know, they, and, the, and I, I truly believe they probably had good intentions to even talk about that going in, but, you know, things change, you clam up, and, you know, next thing you know, maybe you're just talking about how tired you are or different things like that, which, you know, a lot of times fatigue and those types of things, I mean, those are very nebulous concerns, but, you know, unfortunately the underlying concern was maybe some mental health issues. People wouldn't understand. I run into this one a lot. Um, and there's some truth to it. 
you know, probably one of the very first people I saw in the Farm Stress Hotline uh, was an older gentleman from Minnesota, and he lost most of his dairy herd to something called stray voltage. I'm not a dairy guy. I had to look that one up and learn about that one. But to his credit, his wife had even, prior to seeing me, had tried to reach out to find some mental health help for this gentleman. He got referred to psychiatry. Unfortunately, the person that he got referred to had a, was a foreign gentleman with a pretty dense accent. This is a 70-year-old guy with hearing aids, probably stood next to a PTO shaft or a 4020 wide open most of his life, couldn't understand him, couldn't hear him. And unfortunately, that became a very negative impact on him. That was a very poor appointment for him. Thankfully, with his wife's prodding, I'm sure, you know, he ended up getting into me and, you know, we could actually talk and understand those types of things, you know, where he was coming from. I got to learn from him. He got to learn from me. You know, we met in the middle. We found some options for some meds. He was on meds for a, a little while and now he's doing better. You know, that is a lot of times the stories that I'm seeing. You know, it's the folks that, you know, realize, oh, I could use a little help now, you know, just like we're all learning about soil health. You know, I could use a little help now and it's going to help me later. Time, you know, that's a tough one. Am I ever going to ask the guy, you know, Kevin in the ice storm to stop and come see me? No. You know, guys harvest, planting time. I mean, I understand tight windows. Uh, we've tried to do a lot of things with malleability, emails, phone calls, telehealth, uh, different stuff like that, working around people's schedules. Uh, find a rain day, I'll find a spot for you type of thing. Um, you know, we try to be malleable like that because time is not something any of us have extra of. Um, you know, can't afford it was a big thing, especially, you know, 18, 19. You know, a lot of folks were forced to even forego their insurance. You know, couldn't afford the premiums. You know, so I realize I need the help. Everyone around me is telling me I need the help. But I can hardly pay for my kids' meals at school, so how am I going to afford to pay for that? We've thankfully had a lot of change in this area. Uh, we've had some help in regards to getting funds for our own for the Avera Foundation. And I'll bring up a slide later. We also probably just in the last few months um, have gotten some funds through uh, coronavirus funds, uh, federal funds, uh, to help producers throughout South Dakota with a 605 Strong program. Uh, free counseling, free assistance with substance abuse issues, uh, some assistance with medications, assistance with transportation, just a lot of wonderful things that we've never had before, um, but certainly opens up a lot of doors to alleviate at least that part of the concern. Uh, should be able to handle it myself. Once again, kind of the, the unfortunate stigma. You know, I can't see it, so I should be able to figure it out myself. And then with that, you know, you kind of, you know, can you link these two things together? Is nobody can fix what's wrong anyway. Like I said, the producer often doesn't perceive something that cannot be seen or tested for. You know, we don't have any cool tests. Can't throw you in front of an x-ray. Granted, there's a few things in psychiatry. It's a, pretty minis it's a pretty minimal list, you know, as far as, you know, brain tumors, normal pressure, hydrocephalus. There's some things that we find like an MRI, but... That's not going to be us fixing that. You know, that's usually a referral to neurosurgery or oncology or something. But, you know, we don't, we test a few things. You can test for cortisol and stuff like that. But in the grand scheme of things, we don't have any tests that tell us, oh, this is bipolar one disorder or this is major depressive disorder. This is PTSD. You know, all of it is clinical. It's, it's talking. It's kind of working, uh, working your way through an interview with that producer, that um, client, uh, and then kind of, you know, fitting all the pieces together and then kind of working through a, through a treatment plan. And the stigma of mental illness still looms large. You know, you know of all of the subspecialties, you know, it probably carries the biggest, you know, scarlet letter of any of them. You know, everyone thinks you wear it on your forehead, you don't. You know, a lot of people are very good at even covering for it. Um, but the fear is that is if you open up to one person, it's going to be no different than the coronavirus. One person's going to find out. Next thing you know, you know the whole state knows, and that's not what happens. But that is a that is a huge deterrent to folks getting help, and it's it's one that I'm praying we're doing better with. But I, 
you know, personally, I, I, I still think it, it looms large and it needs to continue to be a, a conversation that's worth starting and one that we can work through together. You know, you guys don't need a review of stressors of production agriculture. You know, you're living it just like I am. You know, granted, talking things are a little different now, but, you know, even looking forward, you know, if you look at the USDA's, you know, the Ag Confidence Index that they just did, you know, it was over 100 before harvest. You know, it's that weird index where zero is the worst it could get, 100 is, is the middle, and then 200 is great. You know, it's kind of like alcohol. 200 proof is 100% alcohol. Um, you know, just prior to harvest, it was over 100, like 110. You know, now it's dropped into the 60s again, mainly because of concerns, you know, fertilizer prices, availability, chemical prices. You know, for the livestock guys, it's down in the 50s. You know, there's a lot of pessimism there in regards to, you know, still concerns with supply chain issues and stuff like that. There's a lot of stress, there's a lot of fear. You know, I don't have any updated data. My guess is this is gonna change, but in 2018, over half the households had ne negative incomes. You know, and then we have a lot of the concerns, you know, we need, that we're trying to mitigate, obviously, that's why you guys are at this, this conference. You know, rains, floods, droughts, tornadoes, blizzards, you know, what can we do better to mitigate those concerns? Because we certainly can't control them even though we wish we could. But the weather always comes up. You know, there's not a producer that shows up in my office that isn't, you know, on one end of the spectrum or the other. You know, just a fascinating year. I mean, I had a guy show up in July of this past year, the day before his insurance agent was out and basically called his oats four bushels. It's like, you know, it wasn't even worth cutting for him. You know, now we roll into October and just south of me, kind of down by Worthing, I haul most of my green to FCS down there. You know, those guys are leaving ruts a foot deep in the fields. You know, we just, amazing how quickly it changed, even in the same growing year and even in just areas that aren't real far apart. I mean, those two producers, you know, were only 50, 60 miles apart is all. You know, consolidation is a fear that I guess I've heard from a few folks recently. You know, when you've only got two or three guys making all the fertilizer and chemical and seed, you know, kind of makes it hard to, to price you know, to price check things because, you know, you're stuck. Um, politics, you know, granted, you know, we've only got 535 people in Washington trying to speak for 320 million, and a lot of those folks are farmers and ranchers. So, you know, we, we hope that they're doing what we ask them to, but boy, there's a lot of rhetoric that shows up too. Had to get my token no-till picture in here. That's a, that's a field I've been no-tilling for probably just three, four years. I picked it up from one of the neighbors when he retired. Uh, the home field that we have at home, uh, this was the 28th year that it's been no-tilled. So we've been no-tilling quite a while. We still stick out like a sore thumb. I mean, everybody, everybody asks me, what, you know, what the heck are you doing planting beans into corn stalks? Like, you know, just, and I've heard it all too. I mean, you know, buddies of mine that farm not far from me. You know, try no-till. Oh, I can't do it. You know, my ground's too flat. It's too hilly. It's too potholy. It's too black. I'm just like, I've, I've heard it all. <laughs> you know, I try to be an advocate for stuff like that just because I think, you know, even some of the things that you guys are talking about, granted, I don't have the money to do a study, and, but, you know, if you look at all the benefits that, you know, soil health, even no-till and those types of things can help producers with time management, fuel, cost, all of those things come into play. Those are the things that a lot of guys are telling me are their stressors, but yet, boy, you talk about reduced tillage or stuff like that, boy, a lot of those guys about punching in the face, so. Probably one of the bigger things I tell everyone is, you know, I just try to have fun. It, it, it's okay to laugh. This is a somber talk, trust me. I look at everybody and they're just like, oh my gosh, should I even look at this guy? But <laughs> it's okay to laugh, you know. I tell a lot of people, I get folks in my office like I said, I've been doing this 18, 19 years. Good friends of mine in the office, if we don't laugh, we wouldn't have made it this long. You know, we see a lot of bad stuff every single day. Uh, you gotta laugh, you know. I tell everyone, and I'll come up to it later, you know, talking, to, talking about suicide with someone does not make them suicidal. 
Everybody fears that. Okay, if I ask Joe if he's suicidal, he's going to get suicidal. No, he's not. Even if he had those thoughts, that does not mean he's going to do it. Laugh about it. You know, start that conversation. If you like to use humor, use it. I do. Because, like I said, I don't think a lot of us in our office would make it as long as we have, you know, if we aren't able to commiserate together and, you know, watch a funny movie or use movie lines, anything like that. You know, the weather always comes up. I always put this slide in there because I, I feel like I have to because it's, it's huge. You know, we don't have irrigators and stuff where we're at, so, you know, our, our, we're dependent on Mother Nature. You know, she throws curveballs, which we're all used to. You know, so in the Midwest, obviously, where we're at, you know, historic flooding and drought, sometimes even in the same growing season. Like I said, I watched every single pothole in Lincoln County this spring get planted, and every single pothole in Lincoln County got har harvested around this in, in the fall. I mean, it was a three, two to three month difference was crazy. Even in 19, I've got a, a crick, a rock crossing that I have to cross to get to this little piece. Um, I drove through water probably a foot deep over the rocks when I planted. By that fall in October, November, when I deer hunted that piece of ground, I walked in, in the crick bed with cracks an inch wide in the bottom of the crick bed just four months later. I mean, just fascinating how things can change, how quickly. Uh, producers are lost, uh, crops, livestock, infrastructure. Um, you know, a lot of the ranch guys really frustrated now, you know, struggling with, you know, poor production of hay, especially West River. You know, and then they're wondering, you know, can we make this pay to buy hay? You know, I had a gentleman the other day told me, he's like, you know, the Phillip livestock auction should not be its busiest in July and August, which it was this year. This guy's, there was no pasture out there. There's, not, there's nothing out there. Uh, disaster relief programs, you know, this, another guy brought this up to me. I've, you know, relief programs, they fail to meet ongoing needs. You know, a lot of times there's a lot of money thrown at things initially, and then it dries up, it goes away. And probably the bigger concern that a lot of folks have brought up to me, especially the livestock, dairy, hog guys, is kind of some discrepancies, you know, with kind of, and I'm not a politician, I don't even understand the USDA's programs, to be honest with you. Um, I show up at the FSA to give my 578s every spring, and after that, I'm, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to, a lot, to learn about a lot of those things. You know, but a lot of the livestock guys are frustrated with how, you know, money was allocated and, you know, especially for the row crop guys and stuff like that, where, you know, the livestock guys felt like they were, you know, kind of left behind. And that was, um, I had a pretty fiery guy in my office not too long ago, and I had to apologize because I didn't know exactly what he was talking about, but he was angry about it. You know, livestock guys, it's been, it's, you know, it's tough all the time. You know, granted, there's always an ebb and a flow, but, um, you know, livestock in, in inherently has its own, you know, concerns and stressors. You know, it's, a tw it's like having, you know, when I had, you know, when I had cattle, which I didn't have many, 50, 60, but it's like having 50 or 60 kids. I mean, you can't go anywhere, you know, especially February to April. You know, we got water's freezing, you know, feed them out all the time. I mean, there's, you know, that's a 24-7 occupation. You know, hogs, feeders, dairy. I mean, that's just a tough occupation. Uh, supply chain issues really hit these folks tough. Um, you know, when you're euthanizing animals, you're paying, you know, they're, you know, another gentleman was telling me, you know, they obviously had to feed them longer, so then they got, de you know, they got degraded when they got there. You know, they were forced to euthanize some of them. You know, that's, you know, that's tough to hear. You know, a lot of times when I try to explain things to folks that I meet, you know, I try to give them something to look at. You know, the hard part about production agriculture is you've got this huge amount of responsibility. You know, it's like an upside down triangle. You know, you've got responsibility to your, to your family. You've got to make enough money so your kids can have shoes and eat. You've got responsibilities to the people before you, to the people after you. You've got responsibilities to the bank. You've got lines of credit. You've got crops that are due at the elevator. All those different things. You've got this huge amount of responsibility weighing down on you.
And then this little tiny little pencil that you're standing on top of is the amount of control you have over certain things, like the weather. You know. Granted, I try to tell folks, you know, we're trying to tilt that a little bit. You know, how can you mitigate some of those concerns? Like I said, you know, maybe no-till helps. Maybe having some extra feedstuffs, you know, trying to have some extra money saved up. That's an easy one to say, not easily to do. But, you know, having those types of things to try to tilt that a little bit. But in the grand scheme of things in production agriculture, you're going to have a huge amount of responsibility and a small amount of control. You can control what you, the things that you can control. You can control if you decide to get in the tractor and plant, you know, what, when you harvest, you know, those types of things. But in, in between there, that's, you know, it's hard to explain to folks until you kind of get them to realize, oh, yeah, I guess I don't have control over that. But control the things that you can. Um, so a lot of those things come back to, you know, farmers work where they live. You know, I, I get to leave the hospital every single day. But folks in the middle of a drought in Dupree, South Dakota, they walk out of their front door and the drought is hitting them in the face every single morning. You know. When we were dealing with floods, a lot of folks, you know, I got a gentleman, his cattle yard is still flooded up by Howard. He walks out his front door every day and sees water, you know, halfway up his, his fence line. You know, that's the hard part. It, you can never get away from it. It's there all the time as kind of that knife twisted. Coworkers can be mostly family. Granted, that can be good and bad. My dad still helps out tremendously for me. He goes to Texas in the winter, but... Um, you know, hard part about family is, you know, you can butt heads sometimes. You know, dad has some ideas how we're going to plant a field or what we're going to do for it. You know, we talk back and forth. We end up doing it his way, which is fine because, you know, he got where he was, you know, doing things. But, you know, the hard part about that is, you know, sometimes those emotions, you know, you can be raw and you can stay raw and they can get worse, especially when things get tough. You know, we lash out at the people that we love the most. You know, a lot of times those are the folks we're working right next to. Multiple roles, you know, can be good and a bad thing. Like I said, every one of you probably is able to do multiple different things. The hard part about that is a lot of times, you know, you don't have the time to do those things either. Um, you know, and even different things like, yeah, we all want to be a mechanic, but sometimes... You know, if it's something we don't know how to fix, now we're at the mercy of, you know, when can the dealership get there? Another thing that's out of our control, but what can we do in between? So I talk to guys about trying to tilt the, the triangle a little bit. Okay, while you're waiting for that, maybe you could go do something else. You know, it's just trying to, and you guys are all good at time management, I realize it, but sometimes just kind of bringing those things to light helps folks realize that. Competition and envy. A gentleman brought this up to me, and I didn't think it was that big of a concern, but, you know, it's still something that weighs heavy on us. You know, we're comparative animals. That's what humans are. You know, we can summarize in the snap of a finger. You know, we can see two brand new S670 combines, 780 combines roll into a field and go, geez, that guy's doing really good. My 9660 can't hardly keep up. But, you know, my 9660 also pays the bills and it's paid for, you know, so... Got to remember those types of things too. You know, loss of peers in, in, in the community and the community. You know, I've been doing this just, you know, the farms, granted, I've been doing psychiatry almost 19 years. I've been doing the farm stress hotline about three or four now. You know, and I've lost folks that I worked very hard that I thought, you know, were on the right road. And there's a huge ripple effect in psychiatry in, with suicide. They've done studies. 10, 15, 55 people it impacts, every single suicide. And like I said, I've been on the losing end of it. I like to think that I've hopefully been on the winning end of things sometimes, but you know, the hard part in psychiatry is, you know, unfortunately our failures are oftentimes well publicized. You know, you guys don't have to go far to, to probably know names of people that have passed away from suicide but your victories are pretty subtle and oftentimes silent. So I guess I kind of take solace and hopefully we won a few, but I'm not gonna stand here and say that I, have, that I haven't lost folks because I've, I've worked tirelessly when I, you know, for folks you know, and they still end up you know, taking the road that we were hoping to avert. Um, probably one thing, you know, lack, lack of praise, self-blame. Uh, lack of praise, I tell a lot of folks, give yourself a pat on the back once in a while. 
hey, you got that field planted before the rain came? You know, stop at McDonald's for a cheeseburger. You know, give yourself a pat on the back. I know you're thinking about the next field, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, the isolation, the loneliness, those types of things that come with production agriculture, you know, we lose that praise because a lot of folks, you know, aren't going to give it to us other than ourselves. And we see ourselves as maybe self-centered if we do give ourselves a pat on the back, which we shouldn't. And probably the one thing that's come up, which is why I put it on this slide with the lack of control, in studies, there's not been a huge amount of studies with, uh, you know, specific reasons people commit suicide. Um, but one thing that's shown up, especially in rural areas, a agricultural areas, is self-blame. You know, taking the blame for everything that's gone wrong. You know, you can't control the fact that, you know, you know, hail wiped out your bean crop two days before you were going to harvest it. You know, a lot of, you know, you can't take the blame for holding on to a crop that you thought was going to go up in price and, you know, a tariff with China, you know, cut your price in half in a matter of a snap of a finger. But that is probably one thing that they've kind of teased out of some of the studies that has been shown um, to be at least a, a concern going forward. Um, you know, so now we can all get our in-house psychiatry lesson real quick here. I'm not going to turn any of you into psychiatrists, but uh, so what are we looking for? You know, from the outside looking in, or even the questions to ask. Uh, signs and symptoms of depression, anxiety. So you know, we use mnemonics a lot of times in medicine. Uh, so one that we use in, with depression is called SIGI caps. Uh, if you break that apart, the SIG is Latin. It means recipe or prescribe. The E stands for energy, and the CAPS is caps or meds. Um, first one is sleep changes. You know, kind of the misnomer and I think depression, you know, kind of that stigma uh, as well as, you know, the person that's depressed sleeps 24 hours a day. You know, they might get up to eat, nibble on something, go back to bed. That's usually not the case. The biggest concern that I hear from darn near every single person I see is they can't sleep. A lot of times that rolls into anxiety too. And if you look at all of these, you know, you're going to have those two circles with multiple um, interlocking s symptoms. Um, but what we see more often than not with depression is lack of sleep. You can't sleep. You wish for sleep, you're praying for sleep, but it just won't come. A lack of interest in psychiatry, or in interest, a lack of interest in activity, sorry. Uh, we got a fancy term we call it anhedonia. Um, you know, maybe the person that, you know, used to be in a certain seat at every basketball game isn't there anymore. Uh, maybe not going to the kids' things, you know, maybe not going to family. Granted, we're in the world of COVID still, so maybe not going to every family gathering doesn't exactly mean that you're depressed, but um, something to watch for. Guilt, hopelessness, worthlessness, a lot of that self-blame rolls into that. Fatigue, loss of energy, oh, not getting the chores done, maybe not keeping the farm place quite as nice. Uh, different things to look at there. Concentrating mistakes. I mean, we're all human. We make mistakes. Uh, but maybe those mistakes become more prominent, more regular. Appetite changes. Once again, kind of the misnomer in uh, the movies is, you know, you're sitting in a dark room eating bonbons all day long. That's not depression. That's... A whole nother issue but um, you know most likely it's maybe the wife or something saying hey you know pants are hanging a little loose on the hips you had to move over an extra belt loop to hold the pants up you know it's not eating well and a lot of times then that has additive effects with maybe some other medical concerns let's say you're diabetic and instead of you know kind of following a good constant carb diet you're not eating well next thing you know your blood sugars are out of control uh, different stuff like that you're eating high salt you know, type foods uh, if, um, if you have high blood pressure or certain things like that. So maybe not taking care of yourself in that realm either. Uh, psychomotor changes, uh, that's where we'll see um, kind of a, you know, a lot of times what we'll see, is, especially in anxiety and depression, is more of that lashing out type stuff, you know, kind of that uh, short-temperedness, um, you know, easily frustrated, you know, yelling at the kids more, you know, Sending the wrench across the shop when, you know, you can't get the bolt off, stuff like that. 
And the number one concern, obviously, across all parameters in psychiatry is suicidal thoughts, talk, or actions. Um, like I said, a lot of times we, we kind of get that overlap with symptoms of, with anxiety, too. Probably one of the bigger things we'll see with anxiety, though, is more the physiologic changes. You know, how your body responds. Sweating, tremulous, shaking, your, you know, your heart kind of pounding out of your chest. Uh, a lot of times those are the types of things we'll see more with anxiety. You know, I tell everyone, you know, if you've got chest pain, you find your fear, you know, you got to be at the nearest ER. But a lot of times, you know, when you start to work through some of those things, you know, that turns out to be maybe a non-cardiac reason. Um, and a lot of times anxiety can present that way. A panic attack feels like you're having a heart attack. Thankfully you're not, but um, that's where we see it, probably a little bit more of the physical symptoms with anxiety versus depression. Uh, nausea, dizziness, diarrhea, I mean, people can have all kinds of different stuff with anxiety. And a lot of times, um, that's what we'll see kind of those primary care visits for. You know, a lot of times if you're not digging or maybe not asking the right questions, um, you know, that gets missed, you know, because it's, a, it's actually an anxiety disorder, but it's manifested as intermittent diarrhea or, you know, I got this flutter in my chest sometimes, but. And then fear is kind of the one that goes with anxiety all the time. Um, any textbook you read, you see uh, generalized anxiety disorder and constant worry is probably the first line of any textbook you'll ever read. You know, what happens when we don't get help? Obviously, it's pretty straightforward answers, but... Um, Symptoms can and often worsen. Now, sometimes they, they do get better. I'm not going to say it's 100%, but, and it depends, you know, we can kind of have that ebb and flow of um, emotions, you know, with the ups and downs of things. But, you know, if you don't treat high blood pressure, you know, if you don't make changes, a lot of times it's not going to get better either. Um, that feeling of hopelessness, that self-blame, you know, that we kind of go back, it's just this vicious circle of guilt. It just comes back on itself tenfold every time. It, extremely hard to deal with. Missing activities, kids, family, you know, maybe skipping things even on the, you know, skip, you know, skipping a day when you should be, you know, the cows need feed. Uh, marital stress and divorce skyrocket, divorce rates skyrocket with mental health issues. Not a foregone conclusion, but a lot of times, you know, as kind of stated before, we lash out at the people that we love the most. Um, and instead of using like an off-site person, like as a sounding board, you know, that spouse ends up absorbing a lot of those concerns. Health problems, you know, high blood pressure, uh, a lot of times is the biggest one. Cardiovascular concerns, you know, loom large, uh, especially when uh, co co comorbidly with uh, psychiatric issues. And obviously the number one concern is um, suicide or death. Uh, some CDC data, it's, it's not re strictly related to just agriculture, unfortunately. But, so the C CDC shows that you know, the suicide rate is 40% higher in rural versus urban areas. Well, unfortunately, except for Sioux Falls and Rapid City, maybe even a little bit of Aberdeen, the entire state of South Dakota is considered rural. All of Wyoming is rural. So basically any suicide that takes place in Wyoming is considered rural, even though not all of those folks are ag producers. So the data gets a little skewed, but you know, isolation, all those different things come into play when we're dealing with um, rural areas. And a lot of it can be, you know, probably a secondary concern is, is lack of access to help too. You know, there's just not much help in Timberlake, South Dakota, unless you're willing to drive. Uh, some suicide facts, like I said, we're getting a little morbid here, but uh, South Dakota, it's, it's in the top 10, unfortunately. Um, and it, it kind of moves even a little bit depending on the year. Surprisingly with COVID, it's, the data looks like it's going to back off a little bit. Um, not exactly sure why that is, but um, so we had the sixth highest rate in the U.S. It's not a list we want to be on. What's that mean? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 2020, we had 186 uh, suicides in South Dakota. 
Unfortunately, the Department of Health does not delineate, you know, are some of, I know for a fact some of them are ag producers because just from the work that I do, but uh, not every one of those were ag producers by any means. But, you know, I've said many times, you know, one is too many. Uh, more male than female, uh, probably not real surprising. Uh, more based on lethality than anything. Men tend to choose a, an option that gets the job done where uh, ladies a lot of times will use more like, a, like an overdose or something like that that allows them you know, to still be treated. Um, lethality, and even you know, dropping into our younger folks. You know, we're at Avera, we're actually building a new wing you know, at the Behavioral Health Center with two of the four floors dedicated to kids, adolescents, uh, focusing on chemical dependency use and then expanding our ac access for kids. You know, it starts young. You know, we're talking, you know, almost 20% of high school kids have thought about suicide. That's huge. Scary. You know, what are the warning signs? You know, a lot of times we've heard it, you know, in school and stuff, you know, giving your stuff away and stuff like that. You know, it doesn't happen as much as we would think. It's still obviously a, a huge thing to watch out for, but... Um, anytime a person says something, you know that they've thought about it. And once again, going back, you know, if Johnny says, hey, you know, I've kind of had, you know, I've been having a tough time, you know, with depression, anxiety, you asking them, well, have you had thoughts of hurting themselves does not change, does not make them have thoughts of hurting themselves or change their parameters of that. Uh, seeking access to self-harm, uh, guns is the biggest one. But, I mean, in South Dakota, it's tough. I tell I mean, we all got guns. I know it. I mean, I mean, we've tried, you know, we've tried to limit with um, one of the things that we focus extensively on in the hospital is, you know, is uh, means reduction before a person leaves. You know, we coordinate with family as far as having access to firearms. But I've also had the person that says, oh, I can't find that one gun. Well, that was the gun they killed themselves with. Uh, so, social media has obviously changed in the years that I've done it. Um, you know, talking about suicide, we get a ton of admissions every single week and month of folks that put stuff on Facebook or TikTok and all the different things. Uh, hopeless, worthless, um, acting recklessly, you know, a lot of times that can be not, you know, getting things done and that type of stuff too. A uh, feeling of being trapped is kind of one that uh, shows up a lot in, uh, when we're doing uh, interviews with folks. Alcohol and drug use. You know, alcohol is the number one prescribed medicine in the world. You don't need a prescription for it. It's at every gas station and, you know, on the corner. It's real easy to come by. Unfortunately, it sets up an even more vicious circle of depression and anxiety. Uh, withdrawing, not going to things. You know, like I said, we've kind of hit a lot of these points. A rage and anger, that's more that psychomotor agitation that we talk about, that lashing out. And dramatic changes in mood are kind of come hand in hand. Um, if you feel someone's suicidal, you know, talk to them. Go be with them. You know, I know you're busy too, but, you know, you'll get caught up, I promise. And you might save a life. Um, you know, discuss what you're seeing with them. You know, one of the slides coming up, whether you're a spouse, a friend, you know, the outside looking in prerogative is hardly ever wrong. You know, you don't see in yourself what other people see happening. And a lot of times those are the folks that are there to help you. Ask questions. The only thing that I caution folks on doing, and it's like I said, I, any conversation you can start is a beneficial one, but it, I caution on one thing, it's, it's kind of a phrase I made up, it's called comparative minimization. So basically what that says is if you're talking to someone, basically saying or shaming them, saying, well, how the heck can you be depressed? You only had 20 acres of your field not get planted. I had 200 acres not get planted. You know, you're comparing yourself to them. And we kind of use a drowning analogy in psychiatry. You know, you perceive that person sitting in a bathtub with an inch of water. You're like, how the heck could you possibly drown in that? Well, they, they perceive themselves in the ocean without anything in sight. So just be cautious of that. You know, be, be, be confident. Granted, I'm up here spouting off all these words regularly because I do it every day. 
But, you know, be confident in those questions. I mean, I ask 10, 15 patients a day if they're suicidal. I mean, it just rolls off my tongue. But, you know, practice it, it even if you need to. Um, and then once again, you know, if you ask somebody if they're suicidal, you are not going to make them suicidal. More harvest pictures. Like I said, love harvest pictures. Um, you know, I'd said this before, the outside looking in, spouses, friends, family. So, okay, so we've identified the person that needs some help. How, how do we get them help? Uh, the 605 therapy, therapy is a tough sell. Don't get me wrong, but one, because of the time. Uh, you know, it's hard to take an hour away. The biggest fear was also cost for a long time. We have the 605 Strong program now. Now, it's not an infinite amount of money. It's federal dollars through coronavirus assistance, but still, it's a big chunk of money that we can access for producers. Uh, you can call the 211 helpline. You can call the Behavioral Health um, Farm and Rural Stress Hotline. You can go on their website if you want. The website is not extremely helpful, honestly. And to be honest, they put farmers way at the bottom. I had to scroll all the way down to the bottom and finally saw producers and farmers down there. I'm like, well, that's not exactly where I want to be, but that's okay. Uh, there's groups. Talking to clergy. I mean, I've talked to a lot of you know, priests and pastors in small towns that you know, are referring folks that have finally decided to get help. You know, those are folks you trust. Telemedicine options. You know, if you can't get to where you're, you know, if you you know, like I said, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, we've got options, phone calls, emails, telemed. And I prefer in person because I like to talk to people and get to know them. I mean, there's so many little nuances in psychiatry. I, I can pick up more from a person when they walk from my waiting room to my office than I can on an entire phone call. Uh, meds, not a foregone conclusion. One of the biggest concern with meds, a lot of people fear side effects. You know, I don't want... Farming and ranching, it's already one of the top three dangerous businesses in the world. I don't want to make that worse with meds. We're going to work through some options. A lot of times we'll try to consolidate meds towards bedtime so the uh, side effects are wore off by or during the day. Um, you know, farm machinery is getting bigger, faster. Things happen quick. I've been around livestock. I've had my orbit and my zygomatic arch, my cheekbone, broke when a calf came out of my stock trailer at me. You know, it happens in a, just a flash of an eye. I've had the cow that I could hand feed for 364 days a year, and she drops a calf and bulldozes me out. And I'm just, oh, what? But, so trust me, I, I know how it happens. Uh, options, you know, a lot of folks, because of that fear of being seen in their community, they want to be seen somewhere else. I love that. If you're willing to come to Sioux Falls to see me, a phone call, you know, you might be in Mulbridge, but you're, you'd rather come to Aberdeen because you're not going to know that person. That gives you more comfort, and you're going to divulge more, and you're going to get more benefit from that appointment. Uh, all of those things can be set up through the helpline. Even, di even different pharmacy options. Uh, this came up early in the, with the Farm Stress Hotline. Gave a guy a prescription, and he was just like, you know, I just saw this huge amount of anxiety. I'm like, you're not going to get this filled, are you? He's like... Um, probably not, because, you know, walking into the hometown pharmacy and, hey, Joe, what's up? Oh, you know, just here to get my antidepressant. Well, that's a conversation nobody wants to have. You know, if they were there to get their blood pressure med or their diabetes med, that'd be fine. But uh, so we were actually linked in. Um, our pharmacy downstairs at Avera Behavioral Health uh, will send prescriptions anywhere in the state, even in the multi-state multi area. You know, it just takes one more step out of uh, concern and hopefully improves compliance. Uh, that's our number. I also put the 605strong.com uh, up there too. Like I said, that's new to me, but uh, I was on a task force with that last week and that actually looks like it's, it's a good thing to have. So hopefully I didn't get going too fast at the end there to try to get this done, but uh, Hopefully imparted some knowledge or at least some benefit for some of you. So, Let's give Carl a thank you. All right. If anyone has any quick questions for Carl, otherwise it, we are headed into a... Sure.
a pleasure. Thanks, Carl. Mm -hmm. I farmed for 75 years. And one of the things that I learned, keep a positive attitude because that makes your body work good all the time. And remember, if farming was too easy, everybody'd want to farm. <laughs> and so if, if you really like what you're doing, you'll find a way to make it work. You may have to try something different once in a while. I remember when we first tried soybeans, there wasn't any soybeans planted over this side of the hills, and now they're all over the place. <laughs> but anyway, keep a positive attitude, and it'll help a whole bunch. Mm -hmm.